Hi everyone. Flat earthers deny the existence of space as we know it, believing that the sun and the moon move inside the biblical firmament above a disc-shaped earth, and that the other planets and stars are just dots on the firmament. I've already been over how to completely destroy this by measuring the distances to the sun and the moon using the parallax method in that video. But we're not done. This time we're going to talk about how we know the scale and the shape of the entire solar system. And how it's explained by, and only by, GRAVITY! Turns out the heliocentric model offers even more incredibly strong evidence in support of what I said last time. That gravity is not just density. This is Flurf Pratt. Flat Earth points refuted a thousand times. If you like it, thumb it up, subscribe, and don't forget to hit the bell. Before we begin, let me tell you about the sponsor of this video, Brilliant.org. At Brilliant.org you can take interactive online courses in math and science. Personally, I love it because I can go there and brush up on stuff that's been dormant since university that actually helps me in my job. Teachers need to know more than what they teach, but the stuff they know that they don't teach, well, they end up not using it. And if you don't use it, you lose it. But not only is it useful to me in my job, I'm actually having fun doing it. Lessons feature interactive exercises that award XP if you get enough of them right. Get enough XP and you level up. This encourages you to actually do the exercises and makes the learning feel like a bit of a game. If you're concerned that it might be too advanced for you, don't worry. The courses range from beginner level, like everyday math, to advanced, like group theory and quantum mechanics. Whether you just regret sleeping through high school, want to brush up on old college stuff, or want to learn new stuff to advance your career, Brilliant's got what you're looking for. There are thousands of lessons available, and more are being added monthly. Sign up using the link below brilliant.org slash martimer81 and get started on your free trial period today. The first 200 to sign up using the link will also get a 20% discount on their annual fee. Thank you. Back to the video. What does the solar system look like and how do we know? Well, the obvious answer is that today we can measure the distances to other planets with radar, but that hasn't been an option for very long. And Copernicus actually worked out the relative distances between each planet and the Sun in the 16th century, using nothing but observations anyone can make in the sky. How? I'll show you. First, we begin by noticing that Mercury and Venus are never opposite the Sun in the sky. It looks like they move in circles around the Sun, Venus in a wider circle than Mercury, and Earth is positioned so that we look at those circles almost edge on. Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn can be found opposite the Sun in the sky, so the reasonable assumption is that they move in circles wider than the Earth's distance from the Sun. Copernicus took this to mean that Earth is also a planet orbiting the Sun, and its orbit is between those of Venus and Mars. This resolves a problem in the old Ptolemaic geocentric model of the solar system, in which planets move around the Earth in these funny spiral shapes. Just watch how much simpler it looks if I observe the same orbits with the camera attached to the Sun instead of the Earth, as if the Sun were the center of the solar system. You may be wondering why I'm leaving out Uranus and Neptune. Well, it's quite simple. Copernicus didn't know about them because they can't be seen with the naked eye. So they hadn't been discovered when this method was developed, and therefore I'm going to ignore them here. But I will be addressing them later. Now, if we were to hypothesize that this much simpler model of the solar system is correct and an accurate representation of reality, then we can use it to work out the period, that is, the year of each planet. What we see from our vantage point, the time it takes a planet to return to the same point in the sky relative to the Sun and the Earth, is called the synodic period. For Mercury and Venus, the way we work out the sidereal period, the time it actually takes the planet to orbit the Sun 360 degrees, is by considering that when the planet has moved 360 degrees, the Earth has moved from its original position. 
The planet has to move an additional angle alpha to catch up with the Earth, so they are once again aligned the same way. By then, Earth has moved a total angle alpha, but the other planet has moved alpha plus 360 degrees. If the synodic period is S and the time is measured in Earth years, we find that the sidereal period T is T equals alpha over alpha plus 360. Since alpha is S times 360 degrees, that gives us T equals S times 360 over S times 360 plus 360, which simplifies to T equals S over S plus 1. For the outer planets, it's instead the Earth that has to catch up. The planet hasn't moved 360 degrees more than Earth in S, but 360 degrees less. That makes the formula T equals S over S minus 1. The next step is to work out the relative distances. What I mean by that is we won't be working out the distances in kilometers, but in AU, astronomical units. One AU is defined as the distance between the Earth and the Sun, whatever that might be. Of course, we can figure that out using the parallax method to measure a distance we know in AU, but we won't be doing that here. For the inner planets, Mercury and Venus, all we need is some very simple trigonometry. When the planet is as far from the Sun in the sky as it gets, greatest elongation, this angle here, SPE, must be 90 degrees. The angular separation between the planet and the sun in the sky is this angle, PES, that's easily measured. Since this side of the triangle is 1 AU, basic trigonometry tells us that this side is sine PES. Done. Now, of course, if we try to measure the separation at greatest elongation, we won't always get the same angle. This is because this method assumes perfectly circular orbits. Since the orbits aren't perfectly circular, values will vary depending on where Earth and the other planets are in their respective orbits. So we'll have to settle for taking an average value out of a data set and accept that this method will always have a slight margin of error associated with it. And now for the outer planets. This doesn't actually require us to measure any distances in the sky, we just have to calculate them but it does require knowledge of the planet's sidereal period. We look at the time delta t it takes for the planet to move from opposition, when it's directly opposite the sun in the sky, to eastern quadrature, when the sun is 90 degrees east of the planet. In that time, Earth has moved an angle beta in its orbit, beta being delta t times 360 degrees, if delta t is given in years. The other planet has moved an angle gamma, which is equal to delta t over t, the sidereal period, times 360 degrees. This angle, PES, is 90 degrees and this distance is 1 AU. We see that this angle, ESP, is beta minus gamma. So once again, we turn to our old friend high school trigonometry and find that this side of the triangle is 1 over cosine beta minus gamma. Again, with reservation for the error introduced by the incorrect assumption that the orbits are perfectly circular. Using the 10 most recent relevant data points for each planet, except for Saturn, for which I used 10 data points evenly distributed during the entire 30-year sidereal period, I got these values. Yes, I cheated a little by using historical data, but I don't feel like spending 30 years on this. And the data is not in any way controversial. These are empirical observations of a kind that people have been making and keeping track of since ancient times, in both astronomy and astrology. I used a piece of astronomy software called Starry Night Enthusiast, but feel free to use other sources if you want to try this yourself. Now let's plot a graph of orbital radius r, technically semi-major axis, cubed, and the sidereal period t squared. See something interesting? All our mean values end up along this nice, neat line. This is a proportionality. In other words, r cubed over t squared is constant. This is Kepler's third law. In units of AU and years, of course, this constant is 1. Isn't that odd? This is one of those things that make you go, that can't be a coincidence. And while, yes, I suppose it actually could be, it's certainly reasonable to, like Johannes Kepler, hypothesize that there's actually some mechanism that forces it to be this way. So what could that mechanism be? Keep in mind that nowhere thus far have we made any assumptions about gravity having anything to do with this. Neither Copernicus nor Kepler had any knowledge of gravity other than the everyday experience of things falling. 
Isaac Newton was the one that made sense of this, with the development of two formulas. The universal law of gravitation, F equals G, little m big M over R squared, and F equals MV squared over R, the formula for calculating centripetal force, the net force acting on a body in circular motion. Since velocity v is distance over time, we can rewrite this as 2 pi r over t, 2 pi r being the circumference of the orbit where r is its radius, and t is the sidereal period. That means the formula can be written f equals m 4 pi squared r over t squared. Now suppose the centripetal force keeping a planet in orbit around the sun is gravity. In that case, m 4 pi squared r over t squared equals g little m big m over r squared. The first thing we notice is that the little m's, which stand for the mass of the orbiting body, cancel out. This gives us 4 pi squared r over t squared equals g big m over r squared. Now let's multiply both sides by r squared and divide by 4 pi squared. We get r cubed over t squared, looks familiar doesn't it? equals gm over 4 pi squared. g is a universal constant, 4 pi squared is just a numerical constant, and big M is the mass of the central body, in this case the sun, which is obviously the same for all bodies orbiting it. So yes, if gravity is the centripetal force, then, and only then, will r cubed over t squared be constant. If the attractive force were not a function of the orbiting body's mass, then mass wouldn't cancel and r cubed over t squared would depend on the mass of the planet. Notice how Newton's theory of gravity actually predicts Kepler's third law? But not only that, it predicts a more generalized version of it, because it doesn't just apply to planets orbiting the sun. Instead, we find that r cubed over t squared is constant for all bodies in gravitational orbit around the same central body, whatever that may be. Newton found that there is no distinction between terrestrial and celestial mechanics. There's just mechanics. He was able to unify the two and show that the same laws of physics apply both down here and up there. Flat earthers still can't do that. Actually going so far as to claim that what's going on in the sky is magic. I'm not kidding. They actually say that. The success of this model is clear. Not only do planets known to Copernicus and Kepler abide by them, so do all other bodies that orbit the Sun that we've discovered since then, including Uranus and Neptune. All bodies that orbit planets also follow them, albeit with a different value for the r cubed over t squared constant that depends on the mass of the central body. It's true of moons, it's true of artificial satellites, it's true of planets, it's true of stars and multiple star systems, it's true of gravitational orbits in general, which is why they're also called Keplerian orbits. Remember how in the beginning I said that we would hypothesize that the heliocentric model is correct? Well, the supporting evidence is that the seemingly unrelated and independently verifiable Newtonian model of gravity is consistent with it and completely inconsistent with the old geocentric Ptolemaic model of the solar system. Similarly, the heliocentric model developed without any understanding of Newtonian gravity confirms Newtonian gravity. They confirm each other. They can both be confirmed without each other and they are completely consistent with each other, leading to a unified model of physics that works. Gravity both explains and predicts the empirically observable behavior of celestial bodies. So once again, no flat earthers. Gravity is not just density. We also don't live inside a snow globe. And space is real. And oh, the earth is round. See ya.